Hi, my name is Andre Jack. Hope you're doing well. Come for the finance and stay for the likening. But jokes aside, I wanna say sorry for the clickbait title of this video because I don't think that Ethereum is gonna go to $10,000. I think it's gonna go way, way higher, but I didn't wanna title this video to $80,000 because that sounds way too unrealistic and most people wouldn't click on that. But hopefully, I'm gonna to prove to you why Ethereum is gonna have a way bigger role in our financial futures than most people give it credit for. So then we'll talk about all the ways it's gonna get there, we'll talk about the price, and then I'll hopefully give you some balance to my very obviously biased opinion and my love for cryptocurrencies. But Ethereum, like Bitcoin, is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer medium of exchange. But unlike Bitcoin, we actually know who the creator of Ethereum is. His name is Vitalik Buterin, who's originally from Russia. So hello Vitalik, say hello to the motherland for me. <laughs> he doesn't watch my videos, but he's actually very Americanized. But the crazy part is, he was 19 years old when he created Ethereum. So he's basically a genius. And one of the things people don't really understand about Ethereum is the fact that it is arguably one of the biggest threats to Amazon, which I know is a huge claim to make, but Ethereum is not really a cryptocurrency per se. It's more like the internet. The easiest way to describe what Ethereum is and how it works is to sort of describe how AWS from Amazon works. So AWS is Amazon's web services, and that's sort of an all-in-one solution. It's cloud-based, it's private, and it makes it easy for businesses to start an online business, which I don't know if you've ever started an online business before, but besides getting a license like I had to do with my LLC when I started my YouTube channel, there's a lot of other things that you don't have to worry about anymore thanks to AWS. This includes things like computing power, and database storage, hosting fees for servers, for websites, for uploading digital content to, the coding of all of this. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And AWS sort of democratized our ability to create an online business from anywhere in the world. Because of Amazon and AWS though, over 120 companies from the S&P 500 actually use it. And these aren't tiny companies, I'm talking about billion dollar companies like Netflix, Twitch, LinkedIn, Facebook, and many others that actually use it. But here's the catch. AWS is private. It's owned by Amazon, which means you get to pay Amazon, which means technically Amazon gets to make the rules and at any point it can just shut you off. Ethereum is AWS, except it is decentralized and it can recreate the exact same infrastructures without needing the permissions from Amazon. And that has lent itself to creating these new creative industries that are being built on top of Ethereum, which in the future is obviously going to increase the market cap and therefore the price of the coin. So. Let me just show you some really interesting fundamental metrics that I like to look at. So relative to Bitcoin, Ethereum is extremely undervalued in my opinion. If we take a look at the market cap of Ethereum, which is all the money that's in that space, we can see it's roughly 220-ish billion dollars. If we compare that to Bitcoin, that has a $1 trillion market cap roughly, which means Ethereum is about five times smaller by this metric. What's interesting is that one of the key metrics of good money is acceptability and or usability, which means you and I actually have to transact and be able to use this money and exchange it rather than just hold on to it like a collectible. Now there's a lot of websites that show this data, but if you go to blockchair.com forward slash Bitcoin, you can see that in the last 24 hours, we have had roughly 313,000 transactions on the Bitcoin network. Now that's a lot. By this metric, Ethereum should have about a fifth of the transactions, right? Because the market cap is smaller, it's a little bit less popular, so that kind of makes sense. Now, if we look at blockchair.com forward slash Ethereum, we can see that in the last 24 hours, Ethereum has had 1.3 million transactions. That's a 4X increase over Bitcoin. That's weird. There's more activity and more velocity that's happening on the Ethereum network, which means more people are using Ethereum than Bitcoin. So now let's take a look at the entire network and see the speed with which our transactions get confirmed every time we exchange and use this money. So if we look at Bitcoin, there are two transactions per second happening on Bitcoin. So let's compare that to Ethereum. 21 transactions per second. That is a tenfold increase. Now I know there are a ton of other cryptocurrencies that put those numbers to shame, but remember, none of them are as popular or secure as Bitcoin and Ethereum. So we're not comparing apples to apples, and I'll explain what this means for the price in just a moment, but we are, again, creating the internet all over again. And since the creation of Google or Amazon, Ethereum is building 
industries on top of itself. It's like, if we're thinking about the big picture universe visualization here, on this scale of the universe, Bitcoin is like a massive galaxy. It's creating entire star systems and stars, which are huge companies having huge impacts on the world. On this scale, Ethereum is like the universe and that it's creating entire galaxies in and of itself. I know that sounds crazy, but so does all theoretical physics. <laughs> but let me just show you some real world specific examples that Ethereum is doing right now that not only it's creating, but it's going to swallow, which is going to boost its market cap into the stratosphere. This is gonna get really complicated, but please bear with me. I promise I'm gonna tie everything together. It's gonna be worth it. So one of the industries that Ethereum sort of pioneered and created and it's gonna envelop is something called NFTs or NFTs non-fungible tokens. No, it's non-fungible tokens. So <laughs> what that means is that these tokens are not the same. That's all fungibility means. It's just money that is the same. These tokens are unique. They're not the same and they're also not divisible. Like I could send you Bitcoin and you can send somebody else 0 0.0001 of that Bitcoin. NFTs are non-divisible. And the reason that they have value is because they represent something that is rare and sought after usually in the digital or virtual world, but they're not limited to that. So some people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for what you could argue is essentially pieces of paper, so it seems silly, right? But NFTs take that to another level. So NFTs are like the digital versions of art. So here's a really interesting application. Imagine an artist like Banksy, right? Who's a very famous graffiti artist whose artwork sells for insane amounts of money. Or somebody like Mitsuhiro Arita who designed this exact Charizard card. And imagine he issues an NFT, a non-fungible token that is the digital equivalent of this card where people can buy and bid for exclusive digital rights to this same card. And this is not just like a concept. The biggest nifty sale was worth $777,777 for a complete collection by an artist named Beeple. So after you bought that, you actually even got like a physical case, came with these tokens that you can then verify in the blockchain. Super cool concept. But if you think about what people are buying in this case, it's literally nothing more than a JPEG or a GIF on the computer that literally anybody can just copy, drag to their desktop, and they own the exact same thing. But what they can't copy are the digital rights. So let's go one step further. Imagine owning a meme, something like Neon Neon Cat that you see on screen right now. I know anyone could just post a video of it or a JPEG or a GIF. Is it GIF or JIF? I don't know. Choosing mothers choose GIF, <laughs> we'll go with that. And what is it worth to have the exclusive bragging rights to say to the world, no, 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 I know you can post a picture of it, but I alone own the exclusive rights to be able to show that to anybody because on the blockchain, you can verify my identity that I bought that from the creator. There's a market demand for that and people wanna spend the money. But the combined value between the market cap of the collectibles and art markets is something like $72 billion. I'm not saying that Ethereum is gonna capture 100% market share of that, but this is like the digital equivalent of that and we have no idea how high it's gonna go. This is just the start of the revolution, but it's not even limited to just the collectibles and art market because this can also be given to something like video games. Imagine companies issuing rare in-game items. Like what is it worth to have the Santa hat from RuneScape? I don't know, something, right? What is it worth to have the Buster Sword from Final Fantasy VII, one of a hundred? It's gotta be worth something as well. What about the Moss Immune Blade from Sephiroth, one of one? <laughs> That's gotta be worth a lot of money. It's so interesting. None of us have any idea how high it's gonna go, but that's not limited to just that. Imagine companies from the S&P 500 or sports teams issuing their own merchandise, their own digital equivalents of baseball caps and shoes and shirts and whatever. What is all that worth? I mean, I honestly have no idea, but it's a new frontier that we've just created. And you can be sure that Ethereum, now that it's at the forefront of that, is going to be increased in terms of market cap and value significantly over the years to come. But arguably the biggest contributing factor to its market cap is something called DAOs, which is actually where you can buy these nifty tokens or nifties. It's called DAOs and it's kind of like the entire premise of Ethereum, but you can actually buy nifties or NFTs on top of DAOs. <laughs> No, Ethereum it does not end. It is so complicated. There's so many acronyms. It's like its own little language. So let me break it down. The D in DAO stands for decentralized. So unlike 
a private entity or a company that's owned by the CEO and its founders and members of the board. Instead, these are entities that are owned by the users because they're issued tokens that they hold that are secured by the Ethereum blockchain. And this isn't some crazy weird concept or theoretical thing that exists. This is a real thing that's out there that you can go to right now. There's entities like Rarible, OpenSea, Super Rare, which are basically marketplaces like an eBay that you can go to right now and just use. It exists. It's not an actual company. It doesn't have employees. It's just a platform that you can just use. It's a decentralized eBay. It's super cool. Then we've got the A, which is the autonomous part. So kind of like Tesla, autonomous driving, this is a self-governing entity. So think about it like this. Instead of a, a corporation that's run by members of the board where people vote to do things, right? It's not at all like that. Instead, this is self-governing because it is run by the code that was used to launch these entities to begin with, right? You can't really change the code once you've launched it unless it's in the code, but there's nobody that's making these decisions. It's kind of just run by itself by the code that was written. And then we have the O in DAO, which is organizations, which means organizations, which could be really anything, whether that's a website or a fleet of self-driving cars or an eBay-like marketplace. It doesn't really matter. And one of the best applications of these DAOs, besides the NFTs we talked about with digital art, is something called DeFi. Now, all of this is going to send the market cap again into the stratosphere. DeFi is decentralized finance. So it's really easy to understand, but imagine the traditional banking system turned on its head. So all the things we use banks for, loans, interest, that's what DeFi is coming after. Except the biggest problem that it's really trying to solve is to get rid of the middleman. And here's a really good example of that. It's called yield farming. So yield farming is when you stake Remember, staking just means locking up your money for a predetermined amount of time into a smart contract. So imagine staking our money into a mining pool to give them the liquidity, which in return, we would get interest for. So I know I just said a lot of fancy words that probably don't mean anything, but it's really easy to understand. Remember when we found out that Robinhood was selling our order flow through to Citadel? Citadel is sort of like the middleman. Now, Citadel plays a really important role because it provides liquidity to the market. It's the market maker. All that means is that they flood the market with the stocks we want to buy. Without those guys, if there's fewer stocks to exchange, the prices with which we buy stocks for would wildly fluctuate a lot. So for example, if I wanted to buy a Tesla stock and let's say there was only like 10 stocks in the stock market and I wanted to own one or two, the price I would buy at and the price you would buy at a week later would wildly fluctuate like a crazy amount just because there's not a lot of them out there. So now they're valued in different contexts. But by flooding the market with a lot of them, it stabilizes the price. It's kind of a simple explanation of how it works. So it's kind of like the oil, the grease that makes the system work smoothly and quickly. That's Citadel, but we don't need Citadel. We can be the market maker ourselves. So imagine we stake Ethereum or our NFT nifty tokens basically into the market by allowing people to trade. So we are locking up money, we're giving them the liquidity so that people can make those trades easier and quicker. And in return, we get the interest. So that way we actually become Citadel. So that's yield farming and by extent, DeFi. All right, so let me just add everything up and I'm gonna use really, really rough math and I'm gonna be really conservative here. So Ethereum's current market cap, $200 billion roughly, right? Now, all the other stuff that these DAOs, these decentralized autonomous organizations are coming after, one of the applications is DeFi, which is coming after the banking industry. In 2020, the banking industry was worth something like $6.2 trillion. Now, let's add up all the other stuff that we talked about. NFTs, nifties, digital art, which I really have nothing to compare against because that's just a brand new thing that's being created recently. But let's just assume it's roughly the equivalent of the physical art market cap, which is something like $70 billion. And let's add that up to the gaming industry, which I think Ethereum is gonna play a pretty huge role in the digitization of rare items and rare real estate and whatever it is. And the market cap of the gaming industry today is something like 180, 170 billion dollars. So all of those combined are worth roughly 250 billion dollars, which we will then add to the 6.2 trillion, which gives us 6.45 trillion. But so my brain doesn't explode, I'm just gonna round up to 6.5 trillion dollars. So that's what we have. Now, 
Obviously, Ethereum is not going to capture the entire six and a half trillion dollar market cap that I'm talking about. It's going to maybe get to 10% of that. I use 10% as the benchmark because just recently, Bitcoin achieved 10% of gold's market cap. Gold's market cap was $10 trillion and Bitcoin just got to $1 trillion. And I do think that Ethereum will capture at least 10% of everything we talked about. I think it's going to do way more, but let's just be really conservative. 10% of six and a half trillion is 650 billion. So the difference between the 200 billion that it's at now and the 650 is roughly a triple X price difference, which means that would boost the price of Ethereum per coin to something like $6,000. But that's not the full picture because Ethereum is also competing with Bitcoin. It also wants to be something like a digital gold and a store of value. And it wants to be a currency in and of itself. But the currency market, M2, the global physical monetary supply, is worth trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. That's way too complicated to think about, so I'm just gonna throw out a huge factor right out of the equation, but I think it's gonna play some role. So that leaves us with gold. Gold's market cap is 10 trillion, and I do think that Ethereum, like Bitcoin, will someday capture 10% of the market cap of gold as well. I don't see why it wouldn't. There's really zero reasons why it wouldn't get there. That's an additional $1 trillion market cap added to its current market cap. That represents a five times price increase, which would boost the price of Ethereum to $10,000, not counting the other $6,000. So, that would mean the conservative price estimate for me is between $6,000 to something like $16,000 in the short term, which is something like two to three, maybe five years out. So it's kind of an exciting time, but I own both Bitcoin and Ethereum. I love both. But as far as the potential of what the world will see, I, I think Ethereum is really going to play a really, really big role. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think is going to happen.